In Jesus' name, amen. In Luke chapter 19, I'm going to begin at uh, verse 1 again, where it says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and he could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, uh, last week we started to use this as a kind of a framework or an outline to look at some of the aspects of the nature of God. And we were talking somewhat about his trustworthiness last week. And that we don't need to compare ourselves to what's going on around us, but we need to keep our confidence and our focus on him. Right Now, th there's two aspects of this that I want to bring out again this, this morning before we, we uh, look elsewhere here. At verse 5, Jesus says, I must abide at thy house. It's, it's in, the, in God's economy, as I take direction from the Father and do what I see Him do and say what I hear Him say, it has become necessary for me to come to your house. And that's the visitation that we sometimes talk about. That's that moment that comes to houses where Jesus, Jesus who has so many things to do, so much to accomplish and such a short time to do it in, Jesus who could have spent this afternoon training his disciples or spent this afternoon apart in prayer or spent this afternoon healing the sick, looks at this man and says, it's necessary for me to come to your house. He, this, this guy and his house mattered that much to the Father that he could warrant that kind of personal assignment of Jesus' attention. And God, who is no respecter of persons, cares about you and your house the same way. He cares about you and your house the same way. I don't know if that does anything for you. I'm kind of excited about that prospect and realizing that there are no houses that Jesus won't go to. No houses that Jesus wouldn't be in. That's, that's kind of remarkable when you think about it. And then the second thing is in verse 10, this oft-quoted statement where Jesus says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The, the seek and save aspect of God that He pursues and rescues that it's his desire, and not just his desire, but his passion to pursue and to rescue. And I, I, this is not going to be a morning where I'm going to tell you, you know, my testimony, but one of the things that I vividly remember is being pursued. For some reason, that's, that's been rising in, in my private time lately, and I've been reflecting on those, particularly those three or four years where it seemed like he was just after me all the time. Anybody remember being pursued? I remember. At the time, I wasn't all that sure I was being pursued, but something was after me, that was for sure. As something had a hold of me, and I couldn't seem to get loose of it, and weird stuff kept happening that kept pushing me. And it, it wasn't like I was resisting the gospel. I just didn't even know what I was resisting. I just was trying to have a good time, trying to have life. And, and something was after me, and it was God who was after me, but it was difficult for me to perceive that at the time and in the context. Now come on over to chapter 15 of Luke. God seeks and saves. He pursues and rescues. It's, it's what he does. And I'm not only grateful for his rescue, but I'm grateful for his pursuit. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus begins... Well, let's begin at verse 1 and read this. It says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, 
So he, he's about to tell them something in a parable, which in some way is a response to their hostility towards his availableness, availability, to sinners. Publicans, actually the word more literally means tax gatherers, publicans being an old-fashioned way of saying that. And it's interesting that they keep warranting being specified as a unique class in society, tax gatherers. Now, today, tax gatherers, although not fondly held in our corporate conscience, they're, they're not reviled as the most evil of sinners either. But uh, you could probably think of some label out of the modern vernacular that would describe people of some particular category of activity that would be a, a definable set apart as more disliked than most. And, and that's what we're talking about. Not just people who are engaged in active sin that the public is aware of, but tax gatherers. That batch too. And he's talking to these folks, he's, he's being with these folks, he's eating with these folks, and there are some who find that appalling. That this, this fellow who teaches and does these things would engage with these sorts of people. And on that account, he starts to teach them. Now, it's also interesting to note where he was immediately before that. In chapter 14, you could actually obviously go back a long way pursuing what the context building up to this is. But in the, the thing that happens immediately before that is that in chapter 14, a great multitude begins to follow him, and he gives them kind of the discipleship speech and tells them, listen, this following isn't going to be as easy as it looks. Count the cost. There's something to be done here. You're going to have to drop the other pursuits of your life and pursue this. You're going to have to make this your top priority if you're serious about this. And as he says that, sinners and publicans are coming to him. And sinners and publicans, in responding positively to his statement that this is a commitment of your life and not just something to entertain you for the afternoon, as they come, those who would consider themselves religious, the Pharisees and the scribes, the Pharisees and the experts in the scriptures, set themselves apart and said, what's up with this? Look at who he's talking to. And in that context, he starts to tell them this parable. And he says to them, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? So the question on the table is, if you had a hundred sheep and one of them wasn't here, wouldn't you leave 99 of them grazing here and go look for the one that's missing? Well, the logical answer, of course, is going to be yes. I mean, very few of these people are going to say, well, 99 sheep is almost as good as 100. And uh, really, in the big scheme of things, we're likely to lose a sheep somewhere along the line this year anyway. So what, what difference does it make? Whether it's just lost or whether the wolf got it, whether it needs rescue or... or who knows? What difference? This is not going to be the answer of somebody who raises sheep, right? Not because you're crazy about sheep, but because this is your industry, and you're interested in doing as well at it as you possibly can. And if you had 100, you want to have 100. So he's asked them a question that they are already in agreement with him. Of course we would go find the one. And then he says, and when he had found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. All right, yeah, I guess we'd be happy too. If we succeeded in recovering the one, that would bring pleasure to us. And he says, and when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Well, I, some of them are perhaps thinking, I'm not sure I'm that exuberant, but... Most of them are right with him. Yes, this has been a big recovery from a big loss. Losing a sheep is not a good thing. You can't have so many sheep that you don't care about losing a sheep. And so we're going to celebrate if we find the one that we've lost. And he says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which needeth no repentance. The celebration is for the change in those that change. 
And if you don't need to change, there's a lot of pleasure, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of peace and joy, there's a lot of glory and strength in that, but we're not going to throw a party because you don't need to change. Parties are for the change in the change of the ones that need to change. He didn't say if a guy goes out with a hundred sheep and comes back with a hundred sheep, he throws a party for his friends and says, yay, I've still got a hundred sheep. He said if a guy goes out with a hundred sheep and ends up with 99, he throws a party when he finds the one. We're talking about the passion that says one is enough. The passion which looks at a little guy named Zacchaeus hanging in a tree and says, your house needs a visitation today and I will be that visitation. The passion which says, no one is so insignificant, they will not be pursued. There may be ninety and nine gathered around the throne singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, but the one who isn't still has the Father's attention. It's... Obviously a sobering parable for people who've just been saying, why is he talking to people like that? Why is he dealing with folks like that? Why would he pursue people? Doesn't he know what type of people he's got around him? Doesn't know, he know what type of people he's teaching today? Doesn't he know what type of people he's laying his hands on and praying for and blessing? Doesn't he know? Doesn't he realize what's happening there? I won't ask you if you've ever been that person, but I think most of us have had at least a moment of that somewhere along the line where we've looked and thought that somebody obviously wasn't being very discerning in their ministrations because they were dealing with somebody who ought not to be dealt with. Everybody smiles and nods, so nobody else will think it's you, right? But apparently in God's economy... That's not as big a deal as it is in ours. Now, verse 8 takes us to another level. Jesus doesn't pause. He just keeps rolling. And he says, either what woman having ten pieces of silver? Now, the fact that he, he's addressing, that he's throwing this out in a hypothetical situation like there is a woman suggests that this is a mixed crowd he's dealing with, that he isn't just talking to men. The previous example was which man among you, which, which woman, which woman out there wouldn't. We, you got to have some women out there to make this example work, right? Yes. It would be a peculiar thing to say to an all-male crowd. Sometimes people get the notion that Jesus only had any ministry with men, but you have to read the Gospels and you'll notice that there's women all over the place. And here he's talking to women. He says, What woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? She doesn't say, I've still got nine. Nine is enough. I don't really need ten. I could probably live on eight if I had to. She says, I had ten. I want ten. There's ten. The fact that I have nine is insufficient. I want ten. The Father in heaven is not willing that any should perish. There is nobody that he wants to say, forget them. They're not necessary. They're unimportant. They don't matter. I've got what I need. Are you awake? There is no point in the harvest where he is disinterested in additional harvest. He says, she notices a coin is missing, what's she going to do? She's going to turn on the lights, she's going to start sweeping, moving the furniture. We're going to find that coin. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. You ever phone somebody to tell them you found something? They weren't looking for it. More than a few of you there. They weren't looking for it, but you wanted to tell them because the rejoicing was just that great. Yeah. I've got my car keys! 
You're not coming to give me a ride. It doesn't make any difference to me. But apparently this rejoicing is too big for one person to contain. I just want the world to know. We don't have to change the locks on the house. I found the keys. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about just that crazy, you know what it's like when somebody's that happy about something, the rest of us kind of look at them like, please. I know where my car keys are too. You don't see me acting like that, you know. Don't we? Is there anybody out there who's just always waiting for that opportunity? You know, your friend phones you up and says, I found my car keys. And you go, oh, yes, yes. I hope I get another call like that. Is there anybody who's just waiting to rejoice? No, we just, we play it cool. That's good. I'm pleased for you. Would have been really inconvenient if you hadn't. Yes, I can see that would have been a problem. Oh, and costly too. Yes. Well, praise the Lord. But he says, listen, heaven's not like that. Heaven's not like that. Sometimes we get this idea that heaven is like a judicial court where God is sitting up there being all dignified and everybody else better behave or they're going to be found in contempt of court. I still don't want aluminum siding. <laughs> so we're in a judicial court, and we got this idea that God's just sitting there looking all angry and pompous and everything around. We got big old angels making sure that the kids don't make any noise. Right? This is heaven. This is God's place. We got stained glass windows and candles and no noise. <laughs> so that's the way God likes it. We know because he made us to be like him. And that's the way we like it. Are you home? But I just, I don't see any examples of heaven where it's like that. Every time we get a glimpse into heaven, there's stuff going on. And most of the time, it seems to be kind of rambunctious stuff. And Jesus says in verse 10, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. There is joy. And he's not talking about they put smiles on their faces. He's talking about they rejoice like this guy threw a party over his sheep, like this woman throws a, a party over her coin. There is joy. These angels are slapping high fives and cheering with each other, and they're having a good time up there because one sinner repented. Because one sinner repented. And sometimes we get only one sinner repented. It was like a big waste had this guest speaker, we had to put up this stupid thing, we rented Jilson Square, one sinner repented. Heaven's dancing, we're grumbling about whether it was cost effective. Are you guys still awake? Only one? Only one? Have you ever heard anybody say that? Only one? Yeah, one! Whoa, one, one, one who has changed forever. Yeah. One whose destiny is different this morning than it was yesterday. Yeah, one, one is enough reason to throw a party. And that's exactly the picture that's being painted for us here. This is the father that we serve. This is the father that speaks to us. This is the father that we follow. This is the father's heart. He's never saying, we've got all we need. Let's not bother with anybody else. He's always saying, isn't there one somewhere else we could have in here? Wouldn't just one be worth the effort? Wouldn't just one be enough to put on the lamps and move the furniture and sweep the place? Wouldn't just one be enough to, to leave these here and go and burn the energy to look and see what it's going to take to get them back? Wouldn't just one be enough? 
And now he switches gears and goes to a very different type of story, demonstrating the same heart and the same passion, but in a very different way. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. What has he asked? The, the portion of the estate that will be mine. My share of the family business he's asked for. And the father divided to them his living, is the way this, the King James translates that. But it, what it literally says, and this is amazing to me in the Greek, is he divided them his life. His life. Not just his income, his life. And it, it's such a picture. This, this is, there's so many different things that are being pictured in this, but one of the things which is being pictured is th this is Eden where man is invested with the very life of God. God breathes life into him. And he's received this amazing inheritance, this tremendous heritage. This isn't our world. We didn't make it. It's his. But he divided it to us. That wasn't our garden. We didn't make it. But he divided it to them. They didn't have any, that, that pile of clay before God had no expectation of life, no anticipation of life, no hope, no destiny, no joy, no future. Until God breathed his life into it. And having been given this tremendous gift, having been given this immense inheritance, of course, he became faithful and responsible forever. Adam guarded it and kept it and raised generations of his family there. And they all live together there in peace and joy today, right? Well, that's not the way the story goes. No, because Adam did pretty much what this character did. Because the very next verse says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Wasted or poured out. It's been divided to him and now he's pouring it out. And we're talking about riotous living. What riotous living, quite literally, what it says is, the, 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 the verb there that we're translating riotous is, Asotos, asotos, which is the verb sozo for salvation with a negative on the front of it. He poured out his inheritance on unsaved living. If you think about what salvation means, not just rescue, not just deliverance, but the whole package, the, the, the wholeness, the, the strength, the, the provision, everything that's included in that word, in the concept of that word, and he went to the opposite of that. He went to the living which has no rescue, no deliverance, no provision, no health, no strength, no wholeness, and just dumped everything he had into that basket. He said, that's, that's where I want to throw down. That's where I want to put all the chips in. That's where I want to be. In that unsaved camp. Are you awake? That's what Adam said. That's what many have said. But it can come along in verse 14. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. He finds himself in need. Need to the point of desperation. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent himself sent him into his fields to feed swine. Footnotes always make a point of the fact that there is no more degrading activity for a Jew, a son of Abraham, than feeding swine. Of all the things he might have found himself doing, that's the one he didn't want to do, but need pushes you to places you thought you'd never go. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. 
And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. Now he's rehearsed what he wants to say. He's got this figured out. You ever been somewhere where you figured out before you got there what you were going to say? Went through it a couple of times to try to make sure you said it just the way you wanted to say it? Didn't say more, didn't say less, got it all in? Can you picture what the trip back to dad's house was like for this guy as he rehearses? What's the best way to say this? What's the, no, that doesn't sound humble enough. I better add change that adjective, reverse the order of this sentence, work this around. He's working on this, right? He's got it figured out. But it says in verse 20, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said, that says, less than half of what he'd intended to say. He didn't give his speech. He started his speech, and his father cut him off. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. That's the party that we've been reading about over and over again. So far, this one reads just like the other stories we've encountered. Something he had was lost. He wanted it back. In this case, he didn't go and get it, but when it came into sight, he went and got it. And we're having a party. This is very much like these other two stories, except... There's a little more to this one. It says in verse 25, Now his elder son was in the field, and when he, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, uh, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Dad's throwing a party, and he won't go because dad's not doing it his way. Everybody looks sober all of a sudden. It's a remarkable moment. It's a remarkable place to find yourself. But he's got a bit of an attitude. I've been working hard. I stayed home. I did what was right. Who cuts this grass here, dad? Who shovels the snow out of this driveway? Wasn't him. He's been off doing his thing, embarrassing you and doing that stuff. He was that guy. I'm this guy. I don't remember the last time you threw me a party. We're having a party for that character? I'm not coming. We get in the moment? He's standing outside. He will not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Uh, That's such a picture to me, because this is the moment when if you're all full of yourself, you get all patriarchal. You will so come in here. You come in this house. Hello? The father's out talking to him. This This is a father that's willing to pursue. This is a father that's willing to go where you are. This is a father which has more interest in you than you have in him. And the father comes out to him and he, he <laughs> entreats him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. And that's such a powerful moment. It's so easy to kind of move across it without realizing it. But what the, what's happening in that moment, that transaction is, he's saying, you have the whole wrong 
picture. You've been waiting for me to do something for you, and I have said everything is for you. It's all yours. We could have a party every Friday night if that's what you want. Why didn't you say so? You live here. The fatted calf is available. This is not a problem. We're not poor. Our relationship has not been based on what you think it's been based on. And this is so addressed to the Pharisees and the scribes. You feel like you've done such a good job of serving God that it's made you sour and bitter. And you must have something wrong about what you mean by serving God because it doesn't work that way. Jesus is saying, the father I know doesn't make you sour and bitter serving him. Keeping the law, keeping the commandments, keeping the word, holding the word, carrying it generation to generation, teaching the commandments generation to generation, wasn't supposed to make us cranky and brittle. Wasn't supposed to make us hard and exclusive. Something's wrong when we start to get that way. Some, we're not seeing something right because God's ready to throw a party anytime we need one. He's more available to us than we seem to think He is. We're doing all this stuff. You think, that, you think that by going out and working in the field every day, that's what makes me available to you? You're mistaken. I'm available to you because I'm your Father. And he's got the whole wrong picture. Now, Father's Day, 1984, was the first time I ever preached on a Sunday morning in a church service. I remember the Father's Day message that I did. It was built mostly out of Galatians, but it ended up here in this particular story, and it was entitled Sons Who Serve, because it followed a progression between servants of God, sons of God, but sons who serve, and not serve out of a sense of need or compulsion, but serve out of love. Because it's really cool to have been made the, the children of God, but there's children who love and want to give. And it's okay to just be the children of God, but isn't it cool to be the children of God who love and want to give and want to serve? And this brother's totally missing the point. He's there. He's technically doing the work, but he's not doing it because he so loves his father and loves their relationship and has such a good time with him all the time. He's doing it because somehow or another he's gotten into some sort of legalistic mentality that this is what he must do in order to be fed at the, the table tonight in order to be allowed to continue here. And that's not the condition. That's not the situation. His father says to him, Son, thou art with me ever, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that I should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. We serve a father who loves people who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our dad in heaven loves people so much that he will pursue just one. Even if that just one is somebody like Zacchaeus, who's been up to no good, and who is not well-loved, well-respected, or even well-liked in his community. Our Father wants to pursue him. And we serve a Father who not only will pursue just one, but will throw a party if he finds and rescues just one. And heaven rejoices over one who repents. And if we don't find a way to be rejoicing with heaven over that one who repents, we begin to look like this older brother. A cranky sore head who's missing the whole program. We begin to look like these Pharisees and scribes who are busy congratulating themselves for how successfully religious they've been and have completely missed the heart of our Father in heaven. If we're going to honor him, we're going to have to care about what he cares about. 
And there's nothing he cares about more than he cares about people. He's made that clear to us repeatedly. And that's going to put us in a place where we are going to care about people. And caring about people is going to be a rising priority in our lives. And it's going to work its way up our priority list day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Until we might be that one who's prepared to drop everything to go pursue just one. And who absolutely just throws a party just because one repents. Amen? Let's stand up together, if you will. In the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, it tells us how we make that first step back, if you will, from the far country where we're feeding swine. When it tells us at the ninth verse of the 10th chapter that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I had a man ask me one time, you mean to say it's just that simple? It's like, well, yeah, that's what it says. That's what it says. We confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus. We believe in our hearts that the Father has raised him from the dead. And the result is that salvation that he speaks of. Let's take a moment and, and pray together. I'm going to offer that prayer. You can join me if you will. And frankly, I can think of no better Father's Day gift for our Heavenly Father than making the bold declaration that our hearts believe and rejoice that He has raised Jesus from the dead and that Jesus Christ is Lord. So if, you, if you'd like to, you may pray with me this way. Dear God, Dear God I thank you. In Jesus' name, for hearing my cry today. I do believe in my heart. You have raised Jesus from the dead. And I declare with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, Father, for this new life this great, this great rescue. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.